Thank you, Chris. Thanks, SideFX, for this opportunity to, to be sharing a little bit of, of my story and, and about this, this course that will be the, the spine of this presentation. Uh, I'm a key effects artist at MPC. I'm also the founder of CG Imagine. I founded a co company five, six years ago. And uh, in the beginning, it was more commercial and TV series. And then it shifted towards education. Now I'm only using uh, the company for creating content and courses for, for, uh, for basically Hojini. But uh, I have a, a different story, a different background. And uh, most people, uh, adventure, I believe, is part of everyone's life. But you can suffer it, you can <laughs> endure it, or you can actually desire it. So I've been desiring challenges my whole life, and, and that translates totally to uh, VFX and learning. And we're going to see so much similarities. So um, 20 years ago, I did some wild crossings. I windsurfed the whole coast of Brazil from the southest point all the way to the north. No car, no boat support, just sleeping on the beach for one year. We got robbed twice. Uh, my friend got like a knife in his hand. like so. It was really tough things. I walked across Greenland from one coast to the other, carrying a sled. I did some oceanic crossings with windsurf. And I'd like, I divide my life in three stages of adventure. So the first one is these Rio expeditions. Uh, the second one is fatherhood. It's been a wild adventure as well. And the third one is VFX and, and, and Hojini. Uh, so it's been also an adventure, quite one and very exciting one. So I have like uh, three small videos to show each one of these stages. So this one is, was in Greenland. No VFX there, just real life happening. Good references. <laughs> so yeah, we got uh, a few storms, like major storms during our crossing, like it was one month. Uh, this was cruising the Magellan Strait. Uh, this was sailing around the world. I was the youngest Brazilian captain to sail around the world as well for three years. Uh, this is in Kazakhstan, cruising a lake, 600 kilometers lake in a kite surf. This one was sleeping on the board. Uh, I did a crossing, 400 kilometers, no boat support, just a windsurf. And then I had to sleep the whole night on the board. Uh, very, very hardcore for me at the time because we can always think about ways of giving up, like it's, it's really hard and then you're in the middle of the ocean and you don't have the possibility of giving up. So um, that translates to the walls that we hit when learning VFX as well. There is no, giving up is not a possibility. So uh, fatherhood, uh, the link, I, I can see it's very, very profound. That is the time, the value of our time. Because when you do in VFX, we stay so much time in the computer and time can fly by. And when you have a daughter and, and there is like, every time you are in the computer, you're not with, with her, with her family. So make you value more the time that you're in the computer to be more efficient, that you, you, you really know what you're doing. You're not just rambling around, you're more efficient. So I'm trying to become, um, putting the time, the quality of time that I'm working to be really, a quality of time because I could just be with her. And this is me learning VFX. We all have been <laughs> we all been there. Like so we hit some walls. There is like a, uh, we need just to to overcome that and, and there is a lot of things. And the relation that I see like this is not a VFX shot. Uh, that is that when you go out there if I can simplify the the goal of the effects is not to create an image, but to trigger a feeling on people who are watching that. Like it's always part of a story and it's also to drive some emotional. It can be fear, it can be like, and, and that sometimes is missing when you're trying to do effects. You're just trying to, okay, I need to do an, a waterfall. But okay, in what context? Like, is this a moment of like, oh, like that's beautiful. That is, and what is the feeling? And that helps to, to go out there and to do things, even if it's not hardcore expeditions, but to feel the snow, you know, like to look and look to the sea and, and understand like, because this feeling, it should be translated in the effects that we create. So uh, a lot of that is just looking out and checking references, but also to experience it because then you can go a little bit deeper in the creation of, of the effects. Um, 
So the storm is there, and as in the next edition, uh, we need to, to create a strategy to approach that. When a shot came, like uh, when I was invited to create this course that's a boat in a storm, if I give this, uh, this shot to many artists that uh, I can think that there will be like almost like an infinite, infinite uh, ways of accomplish that. You can tackle that in so many different ways and, and there is so many possibilities and that's the power of, of Houdini and uh, that you can do the shot. So uh, we need to do a strategy and there's all the, all the dependencies. And also we also need to think about the constraints of resources, of hardware, of time, and also how can we address feedback from the client, from the VFX soup fast and, and in a very smart way. So I try to put that all in the course in the way of making something that would be, uh, uh, I could iterate fast with different feedback, even if in this case I didn't have any, any feedback from clients, but I wanted to create a system that I could just, okay, I need more splash on the boat, I need to create. So uh, like, like going to the expedition, you also, we all have the same, um, type of constraints and, and preparation. So this is my personal hill. Uh, that's mostly for courses I created the Houdini. I'm not using any shot from feature movies because you need to ask for permissions for that. And uh, so this is mostly just personal work that I, I, I did. A lot of water things. <laughs> Some things that are not water. Thanks. So, looking to reference, um, we can't say enough. Like it's the importance of looking to references, and even if you're doing something like in another planet that happens with different gravity. The our gravity is always going to be the reference for understanding how weak or how strong that gravity is. So we always need to to kind of like um, anchor ourselves in real world references for in, in a way and another. And looking to this, this is a, a race that happens every two years. That's from Sydney to Hobart. It's an oceanic race. It's really hard core racing because the weather there in the south. It's really strong. And this particular year was 1998. Uh, a few boats sank, people died, it was very tragic. But I was looking to the reference and trying to, to figure out like uh, my, my R&D phase and how I'm going to approach this shot. And, and what you can see when there is a, a storm, there is two things that uh, need to happen for it to become dangerous. The first is that you need to have like a storm that blows for many days, many kilometers. And that's going to generate these massive, huge waves. And we call the period is the time between the crests of the wave, how, how long, how many seconds it takes from, from that crest of the second wave to, to, to pass in the same position. And in the big storm, if it's blowing for a long time, it can be from 15 to 20 seconds. So if you imagine a render uh, or a setup that you have like 10 seconds of animation, it's not enough to have like two waves passing by. And the second thing, and these waves, they can keep traveling. Even if the storm stops, they can keep traveling for thousands of kilometers. But they're very gentle afterwards. They're just like big mountains. And they're going to be, become dangerous again when they hit the shore, because then they accumulate all this volume and they're going to break. But in the open ocean, without the local wind, big waves are not dangerous, because they're just rolling mountains. And then the second thing is the strong wind, the local strong wind. If a wind is just starting and it's just picking up, you have like these choppy seas that become bigger and bigger, but they're not very dangerous, they're uncomfortable. And when a local wind is pushing, you have like waves that have a very short period, like eight seconds between each crest, and they become like just like a noise on the sea. So if you have only the strong wind that just started, it's also not dangerous. But when the storm is still coming and then you still have the strong wind, 
Then you have like these two systems on top of each other. You have the local uh, small wave, mid wave, that rolls, and they are on top of a huge mountain, and they can, can become really dangerous. And that's also something that I wanted to create on my system. I wanted to, to approach in a realistic way, so I created an underlying ocean, and then a simulated ocean on top of that. So you see here, you can see that like the huge massive wave, the mountain, and the top part where I'm putting the mouth is the mid wave that is just added to that. And that one is going to break, not the whole massive wave. A big wave like that to break, you need to have like half of its size as the bottom for it to collide and to, to drag the bottom so that the lip starts to move. So in deep ocean, when it's really deep, it's only the local wind that's going to create. So the system that I did is more or less that. So I wanted to create a grid with a spectrum, so it's not simulated, with the huge wave, the mountains. And then I also created a side simulation that is the local wind simulation that has the, all the dynamics of a flip simulation. And that's going to distort, be distorted by these. So they're going to be additive. And this system gives a lot of control. And that's what I mean by the possibilities. You could do everything in one scene, the big waves and the small one, but it would be hard, really hard to, to get the look that you want in that way. So it's always about like, okay, if the soup comes and tells, okay, the waves are a bit small or the waves are a bit big, you just can address very quickly that. So um, that's uh, the, the pink one in the top is the, the bottom thing that I mentioned, like the huge wave that breaks like that. So I had like the, the small seam, and then uh, the area here is, is just small because it's just the R&D phase. So I'm just using the pointer form, but later I could use just the spectrum inside a, a SOP and, and bring uh, it to, to make the distortion of that. So it was a system very efficient, like I could just do the simulation and reiterate. So another thing that's really important is the VFX based on the camera. We need to think that the, the effects is part of the story and there is a camera coming in. In the studio pipeline, it's easier because the camera is always coming from another department, so it's make obvious for you. But when people are doing effects in the personal work, what they do normally, they, they just create a bound, they create a big effect, and then they try to place the camera in the place that makes more sense and they try to kind of uh, do it afterwards. But with that, you're not efficient because the effects is from this camera and that camera and that camera. How are you going to maximize the efficiency for that perspective? Because sometimes it doesn't matter what is in the side and you could put much more effort in everything that's going to be shown in the camera. So I had like these three shots. Many of the assets I'm going to discuss uh, here are just recycled from one shot to the other in an in a, in efficient and fast way. So um, there is also like this. So for the boat, uh, when the boat is sailing, and you, I wanted the boat to go against the wind, but what happens is that like, you want to have like a constraint, it's, it's better if you have a constraint in one axis. Because all the forces that you're going to um, work with, it's much better if you have like one axis that you can use the drag or, or anything, than the combination of two axes. And the other thing is that if you have the boat going like in a diagonal, you also have like a bigger bound for the simulated area. In 19.5, you have tools to, to have like a more efficient bound, but in general, it's much better if you have one axis. But the boat never goes straight against the wind. It goes 30 degrees, 45 degrees against the wind, and it tackles and do like this Z shape. So I just created my system, my waves and the wind to be 45 degrees with the boat. So just uh, a simple thing that Happen. And even if you get like the assets from, from another department, it's much uh, sometimes worth always making it go back to the to one axis and then you ever after you simulated everything, ever then you can translate it back to position. So uh, the key shot. Uh, the key shot is the shot that you, you can put more time on. That's going to be the base. So my base shot was the mid shot because it's close enough that you have to get a lot of resolution in the simulation, you have to have all the elements, but you also have the horizon there, so it should be able to, 
to portray it in the, in the, in the very far field, and so on. I started by the mid shot that has all the elements. And also one thing, of course, this is a course and you go like, it takes some time, some X time to get to the final stage, but to really bring to the next level would take maybe three or four times longer. Um, in this case, I just went to the first part. I, I didn't keep tweaking and tweaking to make it better because it was just to teach the techniques. So, um, so okay, so to blend simulations, my goal was to have like one key simulation that is the, in front of the boat, in front of the camera that the boat is, is inside and have other simulations in the side. Because if I just have my simulation and then from that I, I, I go directly from the grid and just put white water, you could tell like the waves are not rolling anymore, it's, it's not looking great. So I created a way that I could have like multiple simulations and they are procedurally done. Like it's kind of like an LOG for simulations. You have a few steps that you need to make so you can create as many simulations as, as you need. For my camera, I could go away with three, one in the main camera, one in the side and one in the top. The thing is that to blend, once you start simulating things, they are unpredictable on the edges. Like uh, the edges will never match perfectly. So you always need to bring the, the edges back to zero and then you displace them back with a spectrum, with a noise, back to the same position, then they will match perfectly. And the second thing that helps a lot is the waves advection. If you have your simulations overlap a little bit, you can use the velocities of the simulated area that the waves are coming from to advect into the simulated area that you are working on. So you start by the one that's further away, and then you use that, you advect the velocity with a pop advect volumes into your simulation. And what happens is that like the forces of both simulations are all the same, but you also have on top of that a wave that was going on. They're going to pass by through another simulation. It's going to carry throughout. And then you have like this seamless wave that can just be perfectly aligned. You see like this is two simulations and that wave is just passing through nicely between them. And that helps a ton to make it uh, merge properly because it's not only the forces to create the waves, but once they're created, they have their own life in a, in a, in a way. So uh, advect forces is really good for, for blending the simulations. So the boat animation, there is a tricky thing because you, you need to have like the, the animation of the boat. And I didn't want to do an RBG like thing with the boat. I wanted to hand animate because I had like this specific movement when the boat passes a, a big wave, it hits the water and they kind of stop until the, the wind picks up again the sail and it starts to move again. So, but for that, imagine that like you need to do a lower sim, then the lower sim is giving you the waves to, to do the animation but you need to distort it with the big wa waves. So I did the lower sim, distorted it with the big waves. Then I hand animated the boat. I'm not an animator, so it's not like a great animation, but I hand animated it. And then you have like to run the higher sim with the boat as a collider. But now the boat is moving based on the big waves, but it should be running on the flat one. So what you do, you need to invert the point deform. The point deform requires the animated geometry that's going to be deformed, the rest geometry, and the animated geometry, or the distorted geometry. So you need to flip that. So now the rest geometry is actually the animated, and then the rest one is the, is the opposite. <laughs> yeah. And they both get really weird, but that's the, the correct coll collision for this, the flat simulated area. So you have the boat that is post distorted back and then it's going to work fine when, when the, the surface is going to be distorted. It was really confusing, sorry. But <laughs> you do the inverse. So you need to, you have the, the flip sim, you distort with the ocean grid. With the boat is the opposite. You take the boat and you reverse, you, you, you distort the boat with the big oceans and then it's going to collide properly with the high res sim. Um, the other simulations, the, the, the second one, the side one, and the, and the top one are the same um, 
attributes, this, everything is the same, so it's really easy. You just move the bound and simulate that. You can simulate all in the same position because they're based on the, on the world space spectrum, so we need to, to simulate them in the proper location. So that's the only thing that you do. And for the background ocean, the further away, I use the cusp um, as the emitter for the white water. It's just points, very fast, and and uh, also, uh, they attract the velocities of the grid, the spectrum, into them, so they kind of drift a little bit, and, and they have, they are kind of like alive. And you can do like, uh, you can optimize a lot based on the camera distance, the size of the particles, the amount, and also uh, how much, the, the P scale of, of the particles. So, and then, um, it works real well because then you have like all this rain and, and all the atmosphere and they, you can tell where they end and where the, the simulated area starts. For the boat splash, again, like you don't want to do everything in one simulation because imagine if you have like a simulation and the simulation is good, but then the splash is not enough. And, but how are you going to address that? Because if you start tweaking that, what happens is that Maybe the things that were already approved that were good, then they, they, they will change with the different forces applied. So you want to split as much as you can into smaller chunks because then you can approve separately and they should merge together. So what I use is that because my, my boat was already colliding with the ocean, you already have the a correct initial force for it because the water is going to hit the boat and move along. But what I did, I get like the normals of my boat that's pointing outward and I transfer that also as uh, a force to the, my emission around the boat. And with that, I could just create a, a very simple system for the boat splash that I could uh, iterate very fast and more or less and whatever I wanted to do with that. It, it helped a lot to, to have like this as a separate scene. And, all, and also because of the resolution um, even if you're doing like a smaller particle separation, it's not enough to get like a really defined um, uh, boat splash on the main scene. It's really hard to get like normally the boat hit and you, you, you need to have like more volume around the boat for this iteration. So wave spray, just grab the white water simulation, get everything that's really fast and that based on the age or on the y velocity, you don't want things to emit from particles that are going down because they're kind of dying. So the velocity y is something that, or, or a very, um, it's, a, it's a good threshold to define what you're going to emit. And so it's just a simple emission from the crest, but um, it's, it's all these layers that starting to, to become more interesting and, and to help blending all these elements together. Uh, for the rain, a uh, very simple thing also, it's a grid that I just like uh, scatter points with a noise. And then there's a, a thing that's really important that you, you can do like this noise with the velocities and sometimes they're enough for, for, for getting like these variations on the shapes, but sometimes you need to actually have a smoke seam because the smoke seam is going to interact with the boat and they can create vortices around the, the sail and can do more, more things. It's of course more expensive. You need another simulation for the smoke. So I did a uh, smoke seam to, to create these more interesting shapes for advecting my particles in the system, the rain and everything. So they can just go not in one direction, but they can have these vortices that you can drive and make it more. Uh, interesting and dynamic. So uh, the open shot, this was a very simple one because um, I wanted to, of course, like if you're doing like in a real production, you, you couldn't do all these techniques. Probably you need to simulate uh, some area, some extent, but I just wanted to go to push how far I can just use all the elements that I had into this. And I wanted to give more interesting to the spectrum in general, the waves, but I didn't want to change my boat animation. So I created this mask just around the boat. So I was certain that the animation of the boat would work because the spectrum in that area would be the same. And 
uh, with that, then I could play with anything around that, and I was uh, was able to recycle my boat animation and my boat splash as well. I didn't need to to do anything for that, so I could just use different spectrums for for that. For the white water, I didn't want to do the trick with the cusp that I did for the background. I wanted to do something a little bit different that has more dynamic to it, like the rolling waves. So what I did, I just got like everything, all the white water that I have available uh, from the other simulations. I just have like these uh, edges to fade away on the P scale to make it like really small P scale. And they scattered them into a grid. So <laughs> it's a cheap trick. If you look closely, you can see that like sometimes the, the white water is there, but there is not like a, a real wave driving it. But for the effect, it kind of worked. And it's very cheap because you can just like uh, scatter in the grid put a lot of points and they will work. But uh, instead of using the real um, Y position, you want to flat everything to the grid and then you want to, to have like the spectrum distorting it back because they, then they're going to look uh, more uh, integrated to the, to the ocean and they're going to help break in the tiling because the spectrum is already a mix of different spectrum. There's a, a, already some different movements on it. So um, that's how I did it. I didn't Resimulate anything on the open shot. And for the close up shot, I wanted to use the Houdini 19.5 tools in sub level that has like a few cool things, like the bounds of the sim. I could make it just based on the camera, very tiny, very specific bound, so it could up res a lot. And also the up res. I could use my, own, my previous simulation and I could just uh, up res everything and, and make it much, much higher res. And uh, because the angle of the camera is very close, in this case, I didn't need even the big wave distortion because you could not tell if the boat is actually going up, up a wave or it's just the, the local wind uh, wave that I had like for this. But using these tools were very helpful to make it very fast, very efficient, and give a lot of details without like uh, uh, anything very expensive. So the boat splash, the same thing, but everything for this shot, I was more concerned with the, the first one of the camera to get like everything that's away from the camera, I didn't care, you know, like, so it's more about the efficiency of working with higher res and killing everything that the camera is not seeing. Same thing for the rain. If you look to the rain and the amount of rain, even if you do just a small grid, you see when I put down the camera, it's hard to tell that just this area is the one that you're seeing of the rain. So imagine the amount of particles that you have there is just like very tiny because it's just based on the camera. So it helps a lot uh, with the efficiency of the system. So every shot has a different strategy and that's the key uh, for, for, for it to work uh, in, in, a, in a way that you can iterate faster and faster and, and put more into it. So the main takeaways, here is that break up your shot in different chunks in like, and try to, to do like that because then you can have like things getting approved and that, okay, that's nice. I put that aside and I need to, to work on the next thing and layering things and layering things. A good effect is layered a lot of different elements into it and try to blend everything together. And, um, and also like the camera first, like, you need to think about what the perspective, how this is going to tell, uh, what the story that you're telling through the camera is always through the camera. So you need to think through that perspective that makes sense. You know, like and sometimes you need to break some rules of physics. You need less gravity. You need to put more forces because from that angle, yeah, it didn't work well. So you, you're allowed to do things like that. And the next thing is the where I started from, like is the feeling like, I was, because I've been to the sea for many years and I was doing these effects and I was feeling it, you know, like uh, there was a, some moments where I feel the, the boat and the storm and I was trying to remember the feeling of that and the rolling wave and the darkness of it. And, and that also helped in, in, in not only in how you portray it, but how much fun you have doing things because you are, you are working with the feelings and, and the feelings that triggering you and it should trigger other people that watch that. 
So here, uh, the Storm Seas course is available at Side Effects and the YouTube or, or in the platform is 16 hours, of course, that Side Effects is offering for free. And um, also my site with some courses in YouTube and LinkedIn. And thank you so much. I'm open to some questions if you have. How old I was when I did? When you got into the industry. Ah, okay. Um, I started uh, using Houdini in 2011. Uh, so I'm 42 years old now. So it's like uh, 12 years ago. Yeah, 30. I was 30, I guess. No, no, I think, uh, I'm not sure, but I think it's, it's uh, all in Apprentice, you can, you can do it, yeah. Yes, I do. Um, one of the things that affects, um, I see a lot of demanding for water effects is that water effects is the one that is harder to become like a, a good artist because the feedback it takes longer, like especially in large scale uh, effects. If you're in a your local machine, if you do not have like a strong machine, it takes a while for you do something and that you see if that worked or not. So. And to become good, you need to have like quick feedback. So becoming a water effect artist takes longer, I would say, because of this time of, of refining it and understanding like if I do this parameter, it's going to work, that you go to a point that you can just do the parameter and kind of like imagine what you're going to get and run like multiple wedges at the same time without fearing that it's not going to work. So that, with that, I think it's constrained and give more opportunities to, to uh, not more opportunities, but I think it's, um, it, it give good like um, differentiation uh, as a professional that you, you have like a, a good skill in large scale simulation. Like because uh, in MPC, it's a big studio, I work there. And uh, the, the artists that work in big scale, they keep be shifting from one show to another because they, it's only like a few artists that do the big scale in, in that show, in that, uh, in, the, in the studio. So I think it's the same in most studios. I was just curious, um, what's your strategy for like doing your previews or like working through the process of being able to see what you're actually doing and getting feedback for yourself in terms of how, if it's going in the right direction or not? Yeah, uh, one thing we flip that is hard is that sometimes you can't do a low res scene to try it because then the look when you up res sometimes gets quite different. So the best way is just to create a small bound like really try everything with just a tiny part. But thinking about, first of course you go low res just to get the feeling and, and to see everything if it's working. But then instead of just doing the whole bound low res, it's better if you do small bound high res because the look can change quite drastically between uh, resolutions. So do you, do you send those previews like to your farm or do you do them on your own box and you're able to actually see them in some kind of decent amount of time or? Yeah, there is, a, in the, I have like two, two ways, like in the, in the studio you do multiple wedges, you send to the farm and the next day you have a lot of options to, to see. Um, in the in personal work, I, I try to do like a, on my machine the first, um, first setup to just figure out what's going on. And then during the night, I, I send multiple wedges with just the representative um, frame, frame range, just to get like a what. And also, always like 
do not try to change multiple things into that because then you don't know what that gave that look, you know, like try to keep the constraint and change one of the attributes and change it into bigger values so you can really see what that's giving you the difference. And then you can refine afterwards once you understood like, okay, this giving that look to the scene, you know, like bigger values and, and, and try to keep like a, a just like one, one variable at, at a time to, to change. Thank you. Go. Yeah, yes. Well, it's great, yeah. I'm, I'm shifting uh, my personal uh, work to, to render all in Karma. Uh, what I did, because I, I could render it in multiple, um, uh, in multiple passes, I could have like some things that worked in Karma XPU and some in, in CPU and they, they merged together and like in, in comp I put all together. So that saved a lot of time with the volumes. Uh, even with the ocean, uh, I could use like the, because it was dark and sometimes like the camera was down, you don't even need refraction. So it could just be reflection. So sometimes like you can go ahead and then I could run the, some of the oceans with the XPU very, very fast. And uh, the white water I didn't do. I'm looking forward to the, the new release that they said it's going to work nicely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It goes all the way to the render. Yeah. Thank you.